This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Pearl Harbor, over 70 years later, on this edition of Conversations. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. The attack also was made on all naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. We take you now to Washington. We have official announcements from the White House that Japanese airplanes have attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii and have now attacked Army and Navy bases in Manila. We return you now to New York and we'll give you later information as it comes along from the White House. That infamous day, December 7th, 1941, altered world history. Later in the broadcast, we'll talk with Dr. Patrick Moore about how that horrific day changed America. But first, we're joined by two Pearl Harbor survivors, two Navy men, part of America's greatest generation, two men who experienced firsthand the harsh reality of December 7, 1941. We welcome and are quite honored to have Cass Phillips and Frank Eamon on this edition of Conversations. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. It Thank is you, an absolute you. pleasure to have, to, first of all, to meet both of you and to have you on the broadcast. Let me start with you, Cass. Tell me about how your Navy career began. Sure. As a high school boy in Riverside, California, mm -hmm. uh, the family would go to the beach uh, almost, not every weekend, but uh, several times during the summer. And one of the places that we went was Long Beach, California, which was where the carriers would mm -hmm. anchor out and the battleship California would be out there. And I'd see these sailors walking along what they called the pike. And they all looked so great in their uniform and they were neat and clean. And occasionally we'd get the chance to go out and visit one of the ships. And there they would be sitting in this uh, shiny, clean ship with their girlfriends. And I said to myself, you know, that looks like a great place for me to be. So I decided right then and there that when I got to it, I would join the Navy. And how about you, Frank? In 1935, I graduated from high school. <clears throat> the Depression was on, but I did get a job in a mill. This was in New England. Uh -huh. And uh, th I was in the mill for almost three years. And I heard a radio broadcast that they needed musicians in the Navy. I had played French horn in the high school band, so I applied and I was accepted. So I, I was able to get out of the mill uh, and, and get in the Navy so I could travel around. So, uh, Now, how did you end up at Pearl Harbor? What was the process? And I'll just let both of you tell the story. Okay. Uh, I uh, When I got out of boot camp, I went through radio school, became a radioman, and went aboard the USS Argonne which was the communication ship for the fleet. Mm -hmm. uh, we headed through the Panama Canal up to New York because the World Fair was going on mm -hmm. at that time. We got as far as Norfolk and we spent uh, almost a week there and got orders to turn right around and go back down through the canal again and head for Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Now, we as the uh, mm -hmm. crew of that ship didn't really have any idea why we were going or, or anything about it, but we did that and we uh, ended up in Lahaina Roads, uh, anchored there, and later on uh, moved from there to uh, Pearl Harbor. Okay. And, and Frank, what was your story of getting there? When I entered the Navy in 1938, I went to a Navy music school and was organized into a band, a ba Navy band number eight. Mm -hmm. And then we made several trips uh, on ships cruising around different places and uh, like we took President Roosevelt out to fish one time and, uh, and that was a big experience. I bet, I bet. But then we were ordered to the West Coast so we went over and uh, was, was uh, stationed aboard a cruiser, a light cruiser and then in 1939 the Pacific Fleet was ordered to Hawaii so we went over, so we went with the fleet over to Hawaii and uh, Admiral Kimmel was in charge of the of the uh, the light cruiser force then, and uh, we was on the uh, light cruiser Honolulu, 
And then when he made the uh, Sync Pack Fleet, he liked our band, so he brought our band with him. So that's how I came aboard the battleship Pen Pen Pennsylvania. Okay. Once you were at Pearl Harbor, what was the atmosphere like? Well, for me, it was uh, pretty much all fun, you know. What we were thinking about was getting ashore, going to Waikiki, uh, meeting the girls, obviously. Right. Young right. sailors are like that, you know. I see that running through there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Cass, <right. laughs> Cass likes that idea. Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> well, then, uh, I wanted to get into aviation, and so I put in a request to go to Fort Island, uh -huh. and it was granted. And I went to Fort Island, spent a little bit of time in the communications office, and then managed to get transferred into a squadron, VP-11, which was based at uh, NAS Kaneohe. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was where I was at the time the war started. What was it like? Take me back. That sat Let's go back to the day before, the day before December 7, 1941. Set the stage. What was it like? Well, I'll tell you, that uh, I'm glad you asked about that day because uh, a friend of mine and I had gone out with our girlfriends, had gone out to eat, dance, so forth, and had pulled up on a beach close to Kaneohe, and right close to us, maybe 40 yards away, were a group of Japanese, and they were having a big celebration. They were shooting off fireworks, Roman candles, and skyrockets, and really having a good time. And we commented at the time, they must be doing something really great to have a celebration like that. And of course, then the next morning, uh, we had the big attack and we sincerely considered the fact that they were in on the know that it was going to happen the they, next day. They knew what was going to happen. Frank, what was your The like? uh, Our band, our dance band, uh, was playing a, bi a big dance in the concert at 1010 Dock. And with us was the band from the California and the band from the Ar Arizona. So we played there to almost midnight. And uh, our band received the trophy for the coming in first place. But the uh, next morning we found out the whole band from, from the Arizona was lost. Mm. What so, was it like that, that morning, that December 7, 1941, it, that morning? How, how did your day start? The day started uh, like normal. We had we got up and had breakfast. It was uh, our ship's turn, our band's turn to, to play Morning Colors. So we were all lined up in the fantail overlooking the harbor. We were in, in the dry dock at the time. And uh, it, it, it was nice. The weather was beautiful, just the same as usual. And we would, we had planned to go 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 play tennis over uh, at the sub base because uh, the the tennis courts were free. Of course, <laughs> so so we did that a lot. Then the uh, saw the first planes coming in and the first bomb drops and uh, and saw the red spots on the planes and then and then watched some t t torpedo planes come in and drop and the ships exploding and. That All that. So, so we went to our battle stations then. What was it like for you, Cass? Well, being out the night before, we'd stayed out a little bit late, and so we were slept in. And uh, we got up uh, when we finally uh, decided to go have something to eat at the ship service, and uh, cleaned up, shaved, got dressed, started over there. And when we got in the ship service, uh, on the way over, we saw these planes flying across. And uh, we commented to each other that the Army, which had been having maneuvers for about two weeks, were really making it look realistic because they had put meatballs, uh, painted them on the side of the fuselage. And when we got to the ship service, the girls over there who had been watching the whole thing were just extremely scared. They could hardly talk. And so when we looked down to the hangar, uh, we saw smoke coming from our airplanes and people running there. And so we knew immediately that that's where we needed to go. And so we headed toward the hangar. What did, now, as I understand it, and you please correct me, that you guys really didn't have a whole lot of weapons at Pearl Harbor. Is that correct? Well, we had weapons in the planes, but we didn't have the ammunition in there okay, because they didn't want to leave the ammunition in with the guns when there was nothing going on. Right. 
Uh, but uh, on the way over to the exchange, as I just said, I think that I probably saw the first and probably only plane that was shot down at Kaneohe. I saw him go down, go back behind the hill, and uh, and that was the last I saw of him. So I'm sure he was the guy that went. Frank, as as the bombs started dropping, what was what happened? I was down inside the ship, so uh, I didn't see too much was going on. The we we received the bomb hit, and in, in, uh, in in the middle of the ship, and I was a stretcher bearer at that time, so. It was my job to go up and uh, I was assigned to pick up the dead and the wounded, get them out of the way so they could fight the fires. Yeah. So so that was about the, the extent of my experience then. Did you want to add something to that, Cass? I mean, it's, uh, where were you? I mean, what, what was your kind of initial response? Well, uh, it was surprise first. You yeah. know, we didn't expect that at mm -hmm. all. Uh, by the time we got to the hangar, uh, the first wave had flown over, dropped their bombs, did their strafing, and had left. So we started uh, trying to load the wounded people onto stretchers and uh, onto any vehicle that would run and take them up to the, uh, it wasn't a hospital, it was just a little dispensary. And uh, some people were getting in the planes, trying to get the guns out. Of course, we didn't have any place to mount them. And trying to shoot a 50 caliber machine gun without a place to mount it uh, is pretty tough. You, you just can't hold it. It jumps around too much. Once the attack was over, once the bombing stopped, what was what happened? What was what was the I mean, what was going on? I guess it's it's just hard to imagine. Well, we were doing what I just got to uh, saying at first, uh, and then trying to put out the fires, trying to get the planes uh, out of the way. And then, uh, after a period of time, the next wave started coming in. And so uh, we had no way to defend ourselves, or very little way to defend ourselves, so we looked for places to hide. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I jumped add into something a, to that, what he was saying. The, uh, the old ships we were on, we had no anti-aircraft guns for close-in airplanes. Right. We had two guns that would shoot way up in the air, the old-fashioned ACARC, but the 20 millimeter and 40 millimeter that you see in all the films and everything, uh -huh. the old ships, they didn't have any of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add to finish a little well, bit? Well, uh, so uh, a lot of guys ran into the hangar. Now, why they would go there, you might know that they're going to drop bombs on it. Right. And sure enough, they did. But uh, I happened to be in a room, and uh, as far as I know, nothing, no, nothing, uh, no shrapnel or anything came in there. Uh, and uh, I saw a man sitting on the one of the doors, one of the hangar doors, and when the bomb went off, he just kind of raised up and then just sat back right down where he was and didn't move after that. Later on, people took a look at him because he wasn't moving then either, mm. and uh, after investigating and looking him over good, they found a wound, a very tiny wound right here, and it went in him and went right directly into his heart, and he was dead immediately, of mm. course. Mm. After that, it was just a matter of uh, trying to put the planes out and uh, trying to take care of them, and of course that, that, uh, that attack was over, and we never saw them after that. I've got about 30, 45 seconds. Do, did you hear from people back home? How soon was it before you started talking to people back in the States? Well, that night, they gave us uh, an opportunity to send a telegram back home. And I couldn't think of anything to say. And so I just put the one word, well, son, under it. And uh, when my folks get it, I, I'm sure that they understood what I meant. Frank? We were able to get, get underway in about eight days. So we were out to sea for about a month. And then we finally come in to San Francisco to get re repaired. I think it was two two months at mm -hmm. least be, be <clears throat> before I was able to, to to contact my parents. Wow, it's been some frightening times for them. Thank you both. You're welcome. Thank you. you. Thank you for being on the broadcast, but more yeah. importantly, thank you for your service. You're welcome. I wish Appreciate you all the best. It. Thank you. God Save bless you, you both. Yeah. Frank Eman. 
Cash Phillips, Pearl Harbor survivors, World War II veterans, and a couple of very nice gentlemen who we've enjoyed spending some time with. How did the bombing of Pearl Harbor ultimately change the world? We'll pose that question to 20th century United States history expert, Dr. Patrick Moore, next on Conversations. Dr. Patrick Moore is an associate professor and public history program director at the University of West Florida. He also happens to be an expert on 20th century United States history. We welcome Dr. Patrick Moore to Conversations. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for letting me be here. Fascinating story with the two gentlemen we just had on. Remarkable, I think, uh, when they say they're the, the, the greatest generation kind of thing. There's a lot to that, that these were men who, who gave them themselves in a, in a very different way than what we might see in, in, in later decades, and that's yeah. really remarkable. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, Dr. Moore, I, I think everybody, obviously everybody learns about the Pearl Harbor and history class and stuff, but why did the Japanese, for lack of a better term, have it in for the U.S.? Well, and there sort of seems to be this perception that we were in a void, that they suddenly came out of nowhere and we were surprised, even the conversation that the gentlemen were talking about, that, that there was, you know, euphoria the day before, people were having a good time, and then something happened. But our, our relationship was very strange with the Japanese leading up to that, and quite frankly, they had actually said we're coming, mm -hmm. which was why we were amassing our fleet at Pearl Harbor. We were anticipating it. It really goes back to World War I and the things that happened after World War I. And without going into a long diatribe, we can certainly have our, anybody who's interested can come take one of my classes. <laughs> but um, really, when you go back to World War I, we became an isolationist nation. Uh, and when we left that war, uh, it was very difficult for the United States that we had gone over under President Wilson under the auspices of fighting the war to end all wars, and it didn't work out that way. Instead, it just spurred off other wars. And so the nation, uh, we became very much sort of Fortress America. We're going to stay on our side of the world, and we really don't mind what other people are going to do with it. This doesn't mean that we were free from the things that were happening globally, that uh, especially after the Great Depression hits, that you're looking at a lot of tension starting to, to work forward. Obviously, China was a big trading partner of ours, and especially after the Great Depression hits, we were really reliant on them as a trading partner to make things happen. 1931, Japan invades Manchuria and China. Um, the League of Nations, which the United States never joined, not to be confused with the UN, that's going to come later under the U.S. direction. Uh, but when the League of Nations really did nothing, it sort of gave a cart to, uh, to Ch Japan knowing that they could pretty much do whatever they wanted. By contrast, the United States, despite our being isolationists, was very displeased about this. And we did a number of things. We put a lot of pressure on them to stop wandering around China, um, including an oil embargo upon them and these kinds of things. And, and by the time it gets closer into the, into the late 1930s, leading up to the attack, that Japan had essentially said to us, we put some ultimatum on this, the United States essentially. They said, we want full trade, and we had already, already severed our trade, especially in terms of oil, which they desperately needed. We could no longer trade or support China, mm -hmm. which they wanted us to pull out of China. They wanted us to pull all of our military out of the Pacific. And so these three criteria and a few others were in there. We clearly weren't going to abide by this and said no. And they said, well, if you don't, we're going to attack you at the end of the year. So we, anticipate, we knew that they had sort of said this sort of veiled argument that this was coming. So at least for the federal government, President Roosevelt clearly knew what was happening and, and the fleet knew what was happening. We just didn't know it was going to happen on that particular day. Certainly we would have done things very differently had we. Did they think it might possibly happen at Pearl Harbor or did they think it might happen somewhere else? Well, and I, I don't think we exactly knew what was coming. And there's also that misconception that it was just at Pearl Harbor. We were also attacked. Uh, Guam, the Philippines, Singapore, um, both British, the United States, and Australian forces and sites around, around the Pacific were all attacked on the same day. It just happens to be the bulk of the U.S. fleet was right there at Pearl. So it, it was a much more uh, centered attack, and it was something that was far more devastating to our military as a result. Now, it's my understanding that the United States had actually taken uh, many of the aircraft carriers out of Pearl Harbor, and, and they were actually out to sea at that particular time as well? Yes, a lot of it was, was in Pearl and there was an anticipation. We knew this was coming, we mm -hmm. just didn't know it was then. Right. And again, as they pointed out, everything was locked up. We right. didn't have, our, our munitions were not available, the guns and the ammunition were not next to each other. Uh, it was a Sunday morning, people were right. going to church, they were recovering from Saturday night, right. depending right. on whatever they might have been doing. Right. So um, there was an anticipation that it was happening, but it certainly, it was devastating, but it could have been a whole lot worse. If Pearl Harbor, for some reason, would not have happened, in your judgment, would the U.S. have still ended up in World War II? 
Well, we as historians, we don't like to be predictive to, to play the what if game. Um, would we have, uh, un undoubtedly, the United States would have gotten involved if they had attacked us in a different place. We were already, our tensions with, with Germany and Italy were obviously very, very strained. We had already extended the lease over to the Soviet Union, who we already had an adversarial relationship with, but they suddenly became a necessity. Um, as, essentially as soon as the, the Battle of Britain started and we started providing these resources to, to England, um, it was just a matter of time before this happened. Um, so it would have happened, it just probably wouldn't have, it, the question is would it have galvanized the United States so dramatically in favor of the war? Mm -hmm. um, at the time when Hitler invades Poland and starts moving on, on France, the United States is vehemently opposed to the war. You're looking at, at polls, about 70% of Americans still wanted to stay out of the war. At the same time, 90% of Americans approved of giving material to the British to support them. So we were a nation that was not ready to fight it, but we were ready to support those people who were going to be fighting for democracy. As we look back over 70 years, how did that day change the world? Well, I think the big thing that changes is that we are going to shed our isolationist yoke. Uh, we're going to go from a nation that said, you can do whatever else you want around the world, just leave us out of it. As long as you're not messing with our economics, which is a problem in China, et cetera. But we were one that were not ready to bear that kind of a burden. And essentially, on the next day, we were a nation that said, we're gonna pick up this gauntlet. We're gonna fight for democracy. We're gonna fight for freedoms around the globe. Um, and we're gonna do it. And we've been doing it ever since. Mm -hmm. And really in a way that we had never seen us doing it before. We think about our role back in World War I, and we were certainly pivotal in ending that war, but we came in under, under General Pershing, um, sort of at the last minute, if you will. It would have gone on many, many years before, but the Germans were ready to push through, and we were able to turn the tide of that war. But we weren't superpower in terms of our, of our military industrial capabilities and the things that we were able to do uh, in the United States, largely because the Great Depression hadn't come and we built an infrastructure that enabled us to do the things to create this arsenal of democracy. Um, so the question is, is how did it change? We bore a yoke for it and, and we continue right now, every man and woman who puts on a uniform is continuing to, to carry that forward, that cause which we started there on December 7th. Speaking of economics, how did World War II change economics, not just for America, but talk about for Japan? Well, and that's obviously, that's a huge issue. You're looking at the way we're going to transition away from the Second World War onto the Cold War, and certainly it's centered around Japan. Um, the fact that there was a very different ideological way of fighting wars that took place between the United States and the Japanese. And I think we have a tendency to sort of skirt the issues about how it is that, that Western society, of which we as a nation very much derive from, versus more, shall we say, Eastern, Asian kind of perspective. The issues of honor, um, how it is that you fight war, surrender is not, uh, not an acceptable outcome. Here, if we're losing a battle, we retreat and we you know, counter and we figure out how we can re-engage. They don't engage with that in a different way and it's difficult for the United States and Western powers to really understand how these pieces come together. I think that Clint Eastwood in the dual films that he did with the Sands of Iwo Jima and Flags of Our Fathers really did a very fine job of sort of articulating these two different points. But economically, it will change dramatically because when they refuse to give up the war, essentially, to the last cause, we, we are going to rely on nuclear weapons. And that's going to dramatically change how war is fought. It's going to change everything about who we are as a society. That pivotal event, certainly September, uh, uh, December 7th, uh, was sort of the start of it. And then, of course, in August of 1945, when we dropped those two atomic bombs, um, that's going to usher us into the atomic age. And how it was that suddenly now we go from one war against a Japanese imperial nation, against a communist nation with the Soviet Union, essentially the next day, even though we had really been building up to it for a long time, then suddenly Japan becomes a nation that isn't our enemy, but one that we need to protect from falling to communism, because it sort of stands at the at the edge, of, uh, at the center, if you will, of what our, our our Asian resources and how do we keep those things from falling to communism? And certainly, then in 1950, when China comes across the border and and aids North Korea in invading South Korea, then suddenly a nation in Korea that was on the periphery we find at the center, and the fear of the domino 
theory, the fact that if one nation falls, another one falls, uh, this sort of Dean Rusk idea that, that comes around, suddenly we have to step up the game, and that's going to require an enormous amount of resources, which is going to change us into the country we have right now. The idea before World War II of having a standing army, we didn't really have a standing army. We had to have drafts, and you had hundreds and hundreds of people lining up. Times Square had people waiting all night to sign up uh, to join the armed services that next day on, on December 8th. But that's going to change who we are as a nation in, in very, very fundamental ways that we, we maintain all the way to the present. As I tell my students, we're here in Pensacola, Florida because of that event. Yeah. In, in about two minutes, what parallels can we draw today from then? Well, I think the, the world has changed a lot. I think that um, if you look back to, say, the, the conflicts that we're, we're currently dealing with, certainly the war on terror and how do we deal with these kinds of uh, rogue nations, they're hard to identify as who they are. We had a clear adversary then, um, and how is it that we engage those people who would, who would challenge democracy across the globe is certainly far different now than it was then for a number of, of very specific reasons. You're also looking at the way warfare has changed. Mm -hmm. um, then, I think the gentlemen who were here, when you put on that uniform and you went into battle, you knew that there was going to be losses. Right. We anticipated that now. I think there are great strides that came forward, and certainly President Reagan during the 1980s, when he put a great deal of money into development and, and how is that we were able to fight wars in different kinds of ways. Really, our loss ratio now, if we go into battle, the expectation is that our losses will be none. And mm -hmm. it's a tragedy, obviously, when anybody dies. But now our soldiers are far better equipped, far more uh, capable in terms of technology than they were then. Mm -hmm. And and that makes the world a very different place. And, and how is it that we look forward in, in dealing with conflict in the Middle East, conflict with Asia? It's a different world. It's a real challenge for our leaders, huh? It is indeed. In, in, in just a, a quick couple of seconds here, as you look back during that era that we were talking about, World War II, who was the, the largest, the boldest leader? Who oh, well, I, I, President Roosevelt, obviously, but I think Winston Churchill yeah. was certainly bold. Um, I think if you're looking from our side, not that Emperor yeah. Hirohito and Adolf Hitler, um, they were, it was a different kind of warfare. Um, but certainly, I think the decisions that President Roosevelt made, uh, the way he was able to guide a nation out of depression and, and, and guide us into this war as an arsenal of democracy and, and turn us into a country that even to the present understands the necessity of saying, somebody has to stand up and take this challenge and that somebody will be us. Dr. Patrick Morica, it was, a, it was a real pleasure getting your perspective. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it being able to come in. Thank you so very much for joining us. Dr. Patrick Moore, he is an expert in 20th century United States history, also a professor at the University of West Florida. Also, a very special thanks to Frank Eamon and Cass Phillips, two World War II veterans and Pearl Harbor survivors who were kind enough to share their stories with us earlier. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Thank you so very much for watching. I'm Jeff Weeks. Take very good care of yourself. We'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.